Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic graph theory. Today I would like to talk about one of my all-time favorite theorems and what it does it tell you about pass counting. So it will be the Perron Fabinia theorem. And actually, my first video on this channel was on the Perron Fabinia theorem. So I really love it a lot. And we'll see what it actually means um, in this algebraic graph theoretical setting. It essentially counts pass without counting pass. So um, so kind of we want to count pass, but we kind of don't want to count pass because counting pass is annoying. Let's see uh, what that implies in practice. So here's the point. So I have a graph, you know, here's a little graph, and we know that it has an associated adjacency matrix, right, A of G. And the adjacency matrix, well, what can you do with a matrix? You can calculate its eigenvalues. So the spectrum of a matrix, as a reminder, is just the multi-set of eigenvalues. And this multi-set, I just mean I remember the multiplicities as well. So here, this graph has, for example, 10 times the eigenvalue uh, 0. So that's what I would remember here as well. And the spectrum of a graph is just a spectrum of the adjacency matrix. And we want to kind of use that to prove facts about G. So let's look at this picture here. So in general, um, you kind of should have counting multiplicities as many eigenvalues as vertices. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus 10, so 18 eigenvalues. And if you count, well, you only need to do the count here and then multiply by two. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but also 18 vertices on this side. And that's why I really want to count multiplicities so I can always stay um, kind of have the same number of vertices as eigenvalues. All right, so, um, well, usually eigenvalues tell you a lot about a matrix. The adjacency matrix and the graph are essentially the same objects. So the eigenvalues should tell us quite a lot about um, our graph, actually. Yeah? Well, let's have a look at another graph. So let's do a bigger graph. I'm not counting vertices this time. That's just a really big graph. And the only reason why I have such a big graph is to convince you that there will be certain patterns. And the way you would observe those patterns yourself, or at least I would, <laughs> because I'm very lazy and I'm not thinking very carefully. I just uh, run a few examples in the machine and the machine tells me like, oh, there's a pattern. And then I would observe the pattern. So let's look at the graph. So here's the graph and here's the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are the main players today. So let's actually ignore the graph. I'm kind of claiming that every graph has the same type of pattern. So there is obviously some symmetry around flipping along here, um, like this one goes to this one and so on. And this is kind of expected because what are the eigenvalues? They're the roots of a polynomial, of the characteristic polynomial, and polynomials just have that symmetry. But what is absolutely not clear is that here you have this funny eigenvalue at the very front, which is kind of this leading eigenvalue. It's kind of very strange. It's somehow the biggest in any sense. It's not just furthest to the right, but even if you draw a circle, my circles are probably very bad, but if you draw a circle around it, everything else will be in between. Yeah, so it's the biggest in all possible sets. It's furthest to the right and in absolute value. It's actually the biggest, and I call this the leading eigenvalue. And a fun fact, it appears with multiplicity one. Uh, so it doesn't appear like here my uh, zero eigenvalue is multiplicity zero. And here's also my leading eigenvalue. And as you can see, this one hits perfectly uh, the radius around it and all, everything else is in between. So I should have said you can hit something with the same absolute value, but it's still the only one to the right. But nothing else has bigger eigenvalue. Anyway, so here has this leading eigenvalue. Well, that's already cool. So the leading eigenvalue should tell you something interesting about the matrix. Just think about it. You diagonalize the matrix with A, B, C, whatever on the diagonal. And now you can take the case power. So you get A to the K, B to the K, because it's a diagonal matrix, C to the K. So the leading, the biggest one, will determine the gross, right? So that's kind of the whole, the whole idea why the leading one is so important. Turns out that the story is even nicer and even nicer, and even nicer, and even nicer, ridiculously beautiful. So there's also uh, a leading eigenvalue. So, uh, sorry, eigenvector. Namely, that eigenvalue, the, the one leading one, has a non-negative eigenvector, which is very strange. So why should an eigenvector, so up to, up to normalization, why should an eigenvector be 
not negative. But as you can see here, I just printed this. It starts from 3.5 and they're just all positive numbers or non-negative numbers. There's one number zero. So non-negative numbers. And this is called the Peron, so the, this one is called the Peron Frobenius eigenvalue, and the other one is called the Peron Frobenius eigenvector. And since it says multiplicity one, the eigenvector is actually also unique, and unique up to up to some scaling, it will be non-negative. And that's already some really funny observation that you just get by running whatever your favorite computer algebra program for large graphs. And then you think about it for a while, and you might end up with the theorem which is called the Perron Fabinia theorem. It's one of my all time favorites. It's just absolutely fantastic. It's stated for a matrix, but actually we know by now that a matrix is just a graph. And it's an irreducible matrix, which in terms of graph just means that the G is connected. Otherwise you would run it kind of per connected component. Anyway, so here's a statement. So you have an irreducible matrix with a natural number entries, a graph, then there exists this Perron Fabinius eigenvector, the leading eigenvalue. And there's a leading eigenvector. And um, all other eigenvalues are with the same, uh, well, with the same absolute value are in a circle around the leading one. So here, this graph uh, just has the fifth root of unities as the eigenvalues, and they're beautiful around the circle. And the leading one is the one to the right. And that's just always true. Here, the leading one, you draw a circle, everything else is in between or on the circle. You draw a circle, everything else is in between or on the circle. And the ones that are um, on the circle are kind of Galois conjugates in, in, in the roots of the polynomial. It's really, really cool. So um, one of these theorems, they never tell you about in linear algebra. And it's not quite clear to me why, because it's actually really, really useful. It's just really, really amazing. So there's always a leading eigenvalue and a leading eigenvector. And it kind of controls the whole matrix. So you only need to focus on one eigenvalue and one eigenvector, at least um, for this application. And as I already sketched, the eigenvector value, the biggest one, should kind of determine the growth rate of the matrix. And here's a precise statement. So essentially, the limit of the entries, and I will give a specific example in a second, of A to the G are all of size. Uh, Perron for being this eigenvalue to the n, which is very simple to compute. And, and it's actually even better. You could say exactly how they differ. So they had, you have those leading eigenvalues, uh, vectors. You have a left one, you have a right one, and you just multiply them together. And that gives you the limit of this process. So let me get rid of here. So you just multiply them together and you get uh, this limit. So you can exactly tell in the limit how big the, uh, eigen, the entries of A to the N are, which is really amazing because you essentially don't have to count, uh, they don't have to compute A to the N at all. And remember, A to the N counts pass, so essentially you don't need to count pass. Um, so just in the limit, you know the answer. It's given by the Perron Fabinius eigenvalue and uh, its eigenvectors. Okay. So very, very simple. So we can kind of um, A to the G, we just need to compute one matrix one eigenvalue and one eigenvector, and it controls the number of paths of arbitrary lengths. It is a ridiculously great statement. All right, so let's have a look at an example. So here, my little g, well, whatever, it's what it is. The pf eigenvalue is five. Well, that's what it is. And a to the five, a to the 100 over five to the 100 is one over 30 times the matrix which only wants. And just, just by the symmetry of this beast, it turns out to be the case. Um, so every entry is essentially of uh, size 5 to the 100 times 30. And in this case, the Fabron Fabinius eigenvalue vector is pretty easy. It's the V equals W is just all ones, and there are 30 vertices. So there are 30 ones of them, and the corresponding well, value here is uh, 1 over 30. And I obviously got it wrong. So this should be the same value. So the value here is one over 30. So that works out perfectly. So here is the value uh, you get from the, um, the Perron Fabinius eigenvectors. And here is the Perron Fabinius eigenvalue. And essentially, because these two are easy co to compute, you can just uh, ignore the computation of this one, which is kind of really cool. I just wanted to make sure that this really works out. So here it just works out spot on. 
So this is kind of a little bit of a flawed example because it works all spot on. In general, it would just be and is essentially just. Anyway, let me wrap up by a very, very boring eigenvalue picture or a very exciting one, depending a bit how you want to see it. So I showed you so far only oriented graphs. Um, it doesn't matter whether I have multi-graphs or, or not, but in the non-oriented setting, so it works for all graphs. But in the non-oriented setting, actually something even better happens. So the adjacency matrix is symmetric. So it has this flip symmetry around the anti-diagonal. Somewhere here is the anti-diagonal. And this implies that all eigenvalues are actually real, which is kind of really strange. So eigenvalues are solutions to polynomial equations. They usually don't have any good reason to be real. But in this case, um, they're actually, they're all real. And you can still see the PF eigenvalue here. And now everything is really strictly smaller because they're all real. And turns out that the left and the right eigenvalue, a vector because of the symmetry, are also the same. So the whole setting actually gets much easier. You only need to compute one eigen, so in, in order to get this one here, you only need to compute one eigenvector and one eigenvalue. And the eigenvalue is clearly kind of by the symmetry of the system, just the biggest one uh, somewhere to the right of your, of your picture. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video because it's one of my favorite theorems, the Fabian's ground theorem. As I said, it's kind of a little bit sad that it's not usually proven in someone or at least explained somewhere in a linear algebra class because it's just so powerful and so cool. So here, for example, just in this one example, which is one application of this theorem, um, instead of counting paths, we can just compute an eigenvalue and an eigenvector or two eigenvectors, depends a bit on the setting. And, and that's it, and that's it. It's so it's so amazing, it's so amazing. Okay, strictly speaking, you only get an an approximate solution, but that's usually good enough uh, for a lot of cases at least. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.